The ordinary person doesn't know what the fags do and what their agenda is. The ordinary person thinks that they're just simple-hearted, sincere, friendly people uh, that are being uh, mistreated and bashed and who need the protection of the law, therefore, so they won't be bashed. It just broke loose. I mean, those, uh, they just started coming in droves. Uh, and they started bringing the Bible into it. We hadn't mentioned the Bible. You know, we just wanted that place cleaned up, you know, where the children are and where people want to exercise and ride their bikes and things. But it turned into a big thing. And then on the heels of that, here's my dad going along. You know, he grew up back in Mississippi, back when people were kind of decent. And he thought that the 400-some churches in Topeka just didn't know about it. So he gets him a letter. I remember sitting over there, stuffing those envelopes, sending a letter to every church in this community saying, do you want to step up and be counted here? You must not know this is going on. It grew exponentially. And about a year into this picket, when they were having a humongous counter-protest in the park called Sunday in the Park Without Fred, is what they called it. It was an organized group. The ring leaders were some of these local big churches, Episcopalians, Catholics, Methodists. They had shirts made. It was a cottage industry. I mean, the boil we lanced was far greater in the religious community than in the political or the homosexual. my way. Are you going to move? Are you going to move? Washing up in silver spray, we will walk and worship People started writing us letters, getting phone calls, uh, threatening us, and making it a religious issue. So we just put God's side out. We put Bible sentiments on the signs and started going every day. And Make a sign! God hates facts! That's all you gotta do! The first big sign that was made I made it, and it said, God hates gays. I remember standing there after the sky had caved in over these signs, and it was kind of quiet for a moment. And I said, most of these people would give us the fag. It's the God hates that's sending them over the edge. That's what the Bible teaches. And we can make it a, a compendium. You can't put it any more simple than that. Yeah, it's catchy, and it's easy to put on a sign because they're all, all the words are small, but it sure got attention. It is the notion that there's a right and wrong and that there's accountability for doing wrong. That is a dying concept in our society, and it's all that que sera, sera. I remember growing up, that was when it was shifting, and I remember teachers would say, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all, or live and let live, judge not lest you be judged, blah, blah, blah. That's the psychobabble mentality that's driving this train. It suddenly washed over me that everybody in this country, no, everybody in this world are going to, is going to see these signs. And they're going to have to make a judgment. They're going to have to decide between good and evil. And they're going to have to take a side on it. They're going to have to take a position.
God hates fags. That's a profound theological statement. It needs to be preached. This nation needs it. This world needs it. Look, the language, 12 little words will fix this country. 12 little words. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. And there's a semicolon there. It is abomination. That's the Vicar's 1822. The pernicious nature of that sin is such that the homosexual can't repent. Glory, glory, I'm a gay man. See, it's an axiomatic matter of fact that nobody is going to repent of something he's proud of. Definitions get in the way there. These fags are proud of it. Hi, I'm a faggot and God loves me. Gay Pride Week. Uh, gay Pride Parade. Clinton called June Gay Pride Month last year. It is Jeremiah 615 time. Were they ashamed when they had committed these abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall within the fall. You understand, that sin is peculiar and pernicious because it's the only sin that the sinner can't, under any circumstances, be sorry for. You know, uh, out here on Menninger Hill, they think everything is genetic and that if you are a kleptomaniac, it's because your genes are all out of whack going that way. And if you are a axe murderer or a serial killer, uh, you need a treatment. I mean, you were just born uh, with those things. And if you, <laughs> it's irrelevant. <laughs> I'm telling you, to a Bible preacher, I don't care how you got in your sinful condition, you got to stop it. And the verse is second is the Titus 2:9 uh, that the grace of God has now appeared, uh, bringing salvation and teaching us that denying ungodliness. The word translated denying there means resisting it, ungodliness, and worldly lusts. You should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present time, looking for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the truth. The gospel says. You've got these urges, but you're not supposed to glorify them and brag about them and indulge them to the max and insist that laws be passed, making it all right. You resist them and you call on the Lord God Almighty and live your life on this earth soberly and righteously. And God, that's the answer to that genetic canard.